yesterday I heard about this and this really piqued my interest because I've always known, I've always known that Kenobi would have been better off as a movie and lo and behold, yeah, here it is right here. So there was, I think there was a leak within um, what would have happened if Kenobi did have a movie and, you know, originally that was the case, then it was downgraded into the uh, show that's on Disney Plus, which I honestly don't encourage anyone to see at all. So it really is not that surprising to me, but the way how they would have went about not one, but three movies, that's the part that intrigues me the most. So yeah, I'll be looking at this and I'll be breaking it down because what exactly we would have had is far superior than you know what the reality was with the show you know with six episodes so how exactly would a kenobi trilogy play out like cinematic wise because star wars is a cinematic series always has been you know it's always been the movie so kenobi would have been better off as a movie but three movies how would that turn out when Disney acquired Lucasfilm, they announced that not only would they be continuing the Skywalker saga, but they would also be producing standalone movies set outside the main series. The first was Rogue One, the second was Solo, and the third was supposed to be the start of a trilogy centered around Obi-Wan Kenobi, which not only would have been radically different than the show we eventually got on Disney+, Plus, but it would have seen the return of Commander Cody, Obi-Wan fighting a vision of an adult Luke Skywalker, and the return of Darth Maul. Okay, so already, <laughs> that is far superior than what the show was first off cody i would love to know how uh cody uh broke free of his um inhibitor chip or uh broke free of the mindset after order 66 i don't know if it's similar to how ahsoka saved rex but that is still intriguing nonetheless and then that would have worked it up to eventually when we see cody and rebels then there's um obi-wan fighting like an adult luke okay really bring it back uh what happened with dagobah when luke fought against vader and then he saw his face in the vader helmet and then darth maul would come back which um originally when george lucas sold um star wars to disney he also gave them his sequel trilogy and darth maul was um yeah he was among those that was in the sequels so Disney at the time, um, you know, took his single trilogy, discarded it, and then decided to work on something else. And yeah, I still remember. I still remember that when um, I, I think they eventually announced that they didn't have a plan. They didn't know what they were doing. Then Disney really said, yeah, I didn't know. Like, I didn't know what was going on with Ray and all that. So. I can see a little bit of George Lucas's sequel trilogy in this, you know, with uh, the adult Luke against Obi-Wan, you know, and Darth Maul coming back. So already we're bringing back the original characters in this in good fashion. So let's dive in and find out what happened behind the scenes and take a look at what could have been the Obi-Wan Kenobi trilogy. Prior to Obi-Wan premiering on Disney+, Plus, most fans assumed a movie or a series about the aging Jedi Knight would have taken place solely on Tatooine, with Obi-Wan watching over a young Luke Skywalker from a distance. However, when writer Stuart Beatty was asked to pitch his take on an Obi-Wan film to Lucasfilm, he theorized that Obi-Wan must have left Tatooine at some point during those 19 years living on the desert planet. And not only that, Kenobi must have at least had a conversation with Darth Vader. Yeah, none of that would have ever made any lick of sense because one, why would he leave Tatooine when he has to look after Luke? And, you know, I can kind of see the confrontation between Obi-Wan and Vader, and I'll get into that in a bit. But, yeah, a pitch like that, you know, in relation to Rings of the Sith, just, yeah, no, it, it wouldn't add up, especially in A New Hope where, um, you know, Vader says, when I was with you, I was but the learner. Now I am the master. At first, Lucasfilm pushed back, saying that neither of those things could happen. However, Beatty insisted that they must have happened, pointing to a line in Return of the Jedi that alluded to it, and it's the scene where Luke surrenders to Vader, and tells his father that he knows there's good in him. Later in the scene, Vader remarks that Obi-Wan once thought as you do. Beatty would point out that at no point in the third act of Revenge of the Sith do we see Obi-Wan feeling that way about Anakin. For example, 
but he said, hold on. Hold on a second. Well, not only does he tell Anakin during their duel that he has lost as they debate whether the Jedi are evil, but after Obi-Wan cuts him in half, he leaves him to die. Okay, so first off, he doesn't cut him in half. He cuts off an arm and a leg. Let's get that out of the way first and foremost. Then there's the part where, yeah, they do see good in him. So Padme's last words were, there's still good in him. So, you know, deep inside, um, you know, she knows that Anakin still lives on even in Vader. And when Obi-Wan just saw what Anakin had become, you know, it, it, it was kind of heartbreaking at the very end because he said, you know, you're like my brother. I loved you. So, you know, seeing these two go down the way that they did was, you know, it was, you know, heavy. Like Obi-Wan at that point lost not only, you know, his student, but someone that he really cared for. You know, he he truly, deeply cared about him. And now that's just, yeah, it's just not the case. He now knows here at this moment that um, the little boy that he mentored who grew up alongside him is now gone. So BD argued that there must have been a point where they met again between Revenge of the Sith and A New Hope, where Obi-Wan becomes convinced that good still exists somewhere in Vader, and potentially even tries to save him. After laying out his case, BD would impress Lucasfilm enough to win the job. BD would go on to write the script for the Obi-Wan Kenobi feature film, which was imagined as the first in a planned trilogy, as BD felt there were three different evolutions that the character has to make. Okay, so... I don't know about saving... Um, Anakin because you know that you know the the bridge has now been burnt like Anakin is now Vader and the one person who still believes good at him when he was Vader was uh was Luke because now he knows like he's accepted the truth but he knows that it was Anakin the whole time and you know it, there was some good in him even when uh Vader just Toss the Emperor aside. And as for Kenobi as a trilogy, I can't help but wonder, would it be like a Hobbit situation? Not that I've seen it, but I've heard. Um, the one bad thing about it is that the Hobbit was just one book. And cinema-wise, that one book was stretched out into three films. Now, I, as of right now, I have not seen the Hobbit, nor do I know much about it. Except for, what was it, Battle of the Five Armies? Yeah, a friend of mine uh, showed that to me. But I don't know, it would have been like that situation where it would have been better off as a single film or if there was actually a plan of three films. Like, just, like, I will believe this more than Ryan Johnson ever could when he said, no, I'm planning on a trilogy. And then, like, five, maybe six years later, no, it hasn't happened in order to go from Obi-Wan to Ben. The first evolution ended up being explored in the show, which was surrender your will to the Force and leave the kid alone. But in the movie, the events that would have led Kenobi to get to this realization would have happened completely differently. The film would have opened with Vader taking on five Jedi and killing them all. Reva would have been looking for them and capturing them, but Vader would have been the one who kills them, almost like an executioner. BD's film also wouldn't have included the Inquisitors like the Grand Inquisitor or the Fifth Brother. Instead, Reva would have led a squad of ten Stormtrooper Marshals, commanded by a guy named Commander Jet, and they all would have been former clone troopers and veterans of the Clone Wars, still with their biochips in them, and all would have been played by Tamura Morrison. Yeah, so already, already, like, just, like, bringing back the, bringing back the original characters by the original, you know, people. You know, I can actually see this building up and being promising as it goes, and, you know, having Reva just on the front lines like that. Like, that, that would have sold it even better. Like, just way better. And while they all would have been absolutely ruthless and not missed when they shot, unlike the stormtroopers from the original trilogy, whose poor aim has become a running gag over the years, each one still would have ended up dying over the course of the movie. BD chose not to include the Grand Inquisitor because the character appears later in Star Wars Rebels. So about that, the, the actor for the Grand Inquisitor didn't even look at Rebels. In fact, let me say this right now. What works for Kenobi the show and what doesn't is the fact that the writer didn't even know what Revenge of the Sith was. Like, flat out didn't. So, 
there's a scene in Kenobi, and yeah, spoilers, but who cares? Uh, there's a scene in that where, yeah, Kenobi and Vader do meet up again when little Leia is running away. And there's a part where Vader is dragging Kenobi by the fire on the ground. That, to me, feels like payback. Because Kenobi just walked away while Anakin was being roasted alive. So, yeah, here comes the rematch. And then the one thing that he does is, for one, not kill Obi-Wan because that would be too easy. No, just, no, just let him know how he felt. Drag him on the fire. So, at one point, I thought, okay, yeah, sure. But at the same time, oh, did look at the rent of the Sith. So, huh. In contest to that, how would that feel? So he felt audiences would know that the character wouldn't die, taking away some of the jeopardy from the story. This is why Beatty created the character of Reva, so audiences wouldn't know whether the character survives or not, and also for Obi-Wan to have a foe he could defeat, save, or potentially kill, since he couldn't do that with Vader. However, Beatty's version of Reva was dramatically different from the one in the show. In the movie, Reva didn't know that Darth Vader was Anakin. It would have been Kenobi who told her, which would have made Okay, and then there's another part where, um... Obi-Wan would just sense that Vader is Anakin. So in Revenge of the Sith, when he's looking at a hologram projection of Anakin, you know, doing what he did with the younglings, at that point, he only knew, like, the title of Vader by name to Anakin. So he knew completely that, you know, when Anakin had the Vader suit on, yeah, no, that's when, to me, Obi-Wan knew completely. like right then and there like no that was it anakin is darth vader made her go from a villain to realizing that the guy she works for darth vader is the one who massacred the jedi killed all her friends and almost killed her leaving her for dead for his part vader would have been absolutely obsessed with finding kenobi and getting revenge over what he did to him there it is in the film palpatine would have ordered vader to travel to and crush a rebel uprising on a moon but vader would have pushed back arguing that they should focus on finding kenobi instead calling him one of the two biggest threats in the galaxy like, I even said it originally, why wasn't the Kenobi show just about these Inquisitors hunting him down and, you know, Kenobi potentially finding other Jedi so he could protect them? It's like, you know, he has to protect Luke and then other Jedi because the intro to the first episode of Kenobi was pretty solid where they show up at that katina hunting down Jedi and they, you know, they hunt down one. Reva was just obsessed with finding kenobi and i can it makes way more sense for vader to do that than for reva to have that obsession the emperor then would have mockingly responded with pity you didn't kill him when you had the chance followed by vader clapping back by reminding palpatine that the other threat is yoda this would have enraged palpatine who tells vader to know his place and let it go like there's still yeah there's still other jedi out there like what immediately comes to mind is kenobi who's on Tatooine. Then there's Yoda, who resided in Dagobah. And then there was also, I think this might be a minority, but Cal Kestis from Fallen Order, um, who escaped Order 66 when he was just a boy. And then there was Ahsoka, um, who had her taste of Order 66 and escaped with Rex after saving him from the Inhibitor ship. In the Disney series, there's a moment where Obi-Wan briefly encounters a homeless clone trooper on the streets of Coruscant. However, in the movie, this would have been taken one step further, as Commander Cody would have played a major role in the story. In the Clone Wars series, it's revealed that all clone troopers were implanted with inhibitor chips, which is how Palpatine is able to initiate Order 66. By the time of the movie, Cody would have had this chip removed and been racked with guilt over his attempt to kill Kenobi. Okay, so I would love to see that, like... I don't care where I have to see it or read about it. I would like, I need a play by play on that. Cody removing the chip. Give me a scene where I can see or know of that. 
As a result, Cody would have devoted his life to right this wrong and protect Kenobi at all costs. The first time we would have seen him in the film would have been near the beginning, when Obi-Wan goes into town. Cody would have followed him through the streets and attacked him, taking him into an alley with a knife to his throat before saying, you're dead. From here, he'd lower the knife, as we'd realize Cody is making a point as he tells Kenobi he has to be more careful. This scene would have been used to establish how disconnected Obi-Wan is from the Force, which is why Obi-Wan doesn't sense Cody following him. And besides not practicing it while in hiding, Kenobi is also disconnected from the Force because he's forcing his will upon Luke to be the greatest Jedi ever. Like, already, already, like, bringing Cody back in the best way possible, like this right here, like, this feels way more convincing than the show ever could. No, like, bringing Cody back, perfect, and then, you know, not repeating the same mistakes that he did with Anakin. I mean, granted, I don't think it was a mistake, but for for Anakin here, it was just, he went through so much, lost so much. So it made sense for him to go down the path that he did. But yeah, to not repeat what happened with Anakin with Luke, I feel like that, yeah, that's, that goes like way deeper. So I think um, Obi-Wan just being disconnected from the Force feels bit, uh, bittersweet. But I think it's the best kind of bittersweet because would he really go through the same tragedy twice especially with um his you know partner's son like it can't happen twice and fix everything in the galaxy. BD drew inspiration from Superman 2, which sees the Man of Steel stripped of his powers. The idea, which BD says was kind of done in the final Obi-Wan series, was to finally have an amazing moment at the end of the film, similar to when Superman gets his powers back and crushes Zod's hand. And so by the end of the film, Obi-Wan would find his way back to the Force and surrender to the will of it by leaving Luke alone. At one point in the film, Obi-Wan would have helped a group of religious refugees evade the Empire, and this group would have worshipped a goddess that they claimed controlled all life until obi-wan realizes that what they're worshiping is the force okay i don't think this would have been the the force deities whether it be the to me i don't know who it would have been the father or the daughter it would have been one of those but um you know going to luke yeah like it would make more sense actually yeah going back to the show because you know he was always keeping tabs on him and just wondering is he force sensitive is he showing signs that would potentially put him in danger and you know the inquisitors would start showing up maybe vader shows up just you know setting the place on fire so i think it's a good thing that he didn't really show any attachment at all which you know is part of the jedi code you know you can't show attachments because you know, let's we forget what Anakin went through when he had his attachments and uh, he was not granted a title of master and he had to keep his marriage with Padme a secret. Like, <laughs> oh man, like Anakin was, he was, he was going through some things. And the leader of this group, Tao, would have taken Obi-Wan to their sacred shrine, where he would have had a force vision on Mustafar reminiscent of the cave scene in The Empire Strikes Back. Seeing a man in a dark robe with a lightsaber, Obi-Wan would have assumed it was Anakin, only to realize that it's actually Luke, all grown up, who attacks him as the two have a lightsaber battle on the lava planet. The duel would have ended with Luke almost killing Obi-Wan, before Obi-Wan snaps out of the vision and wakes up back on Tatooine. What Obi-Wan would have taken away from this vision of the future is that if he keeps trying to train Luke and put all this pressure in guilt on the kid, Luke's eventually going to turn to the dark side. Keep in mind this appearance of a DH Mark Hamill as Luke would have predated his appearance on The Mandalorian. Oh my god, so I think how this would have played out would have been, okay, have Luke mature and grow up because he was still a kid. No, like, straight up, like, just have him grow. Have him become mature, like, let nature do his thing, and then after that, you know, have him be trained properly. So I feel like going back to A New Hope, that's when, you know, Luke was introduced to pretty much everything. The Force, um, Anakin's lightsaber. Like, um, Luke, I think, was well-informed of the Clone Wars. But he wasn't well-informed of, like, you know, uh, what happened to Anakin, and rightfully so, because, you know, 
Obi-Wan or Ben at the time just hid it from him until he was actually ready. It's like that coming of age thing where they weren't aware of it until they were like a certain age and um, until the time was right for them to actually say what needs to be said. So for, for Luke here, that makes, not only does it make sense, but it also works. Because like, you know, when would Luke have been ready? And I think in A New Hope, um, we see that, especially when um, the Empire was just, you know, was on the rise. They had the Death Star ready to go. Um, Owen and Baru met their end, sadly. So, no, that I think it was the appropriate time for the calling. And, yeah, Luke just began his training. Similar to a buddy cop movie, the relationship between Obi-Wan and Cody would have been like an old married couple, as the two would constantly bicker all the time, but also reminisce about the good old days. Say I would love to see that. <laughs> I would love to see that. Like, I would love that so much. Think stuff like, God, it was so much better when we had an army at our backs. Eventually, just like in the Disney Plus series, Obi-Wan would have had to leave Tatooine. Except in the movie, Obi-Wan would have asked Cody to watch over Luke. This would have given the film a fun little B story to keep cutting back to during Obi-Wan's off-world adventure. Like, that just makes perfect sense because in the show, he just leaves Luke behind just to go after Leia? Like, oh my god. And then Cody would just, you know, stick around and keep eye on the kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, like, I mean, granted, Luke was already living with Owen Baru, and, you know, that was fine, but just having Cody there, like, a man who can literally, like, a man who was heavily armed, ready to go at any time, like, that, no, nah, that would have been, like, so far, this is hella convincing. At one point during the film, Cody and Owen would have discovered some bounty hunters that had discovered Obi-Wan. After killing them, they would have argued about what to do with the bodies. Eventually, they would have settled on dumping them in the Sarlacc pit, so they travel to it, and while they're tossing the bodies in, they're busy having an argument about Cody shooting Obi-Wan in Revenge of the Sith. While this is happening, someone else arrives with a dead alien that they also want to quietly dispose of in the pit. Basically, it would have been exactly like this bit on The Simpsons. The whole movie would have built to a confrontation between Obi-Wan and Vader that sees the two men duel on a space station as it falls apart in the atmosphere of a giant planet. During the battle, Obi-Wan would have slashed Vader's helmet, giving Anakin the scar on his forehead. And I, I, I love that. I love when they, um, where they show off a reason behind like little tidbits like that. I really like that. I recently saw Clone Wars, like not the Clone Wars, just, you know, Star Wars, Clone Wars, and little tidbits like why Grievous was always coughing in Revenge of the Sith, like, now I know because I saw that and what Mace did to him. So I really, really like little tidbits like that. And revealing his face under the mask. It's at this point that Obi-Wan realizes that there's an alternative to waiting for Luke to grow up so that he can train him to be a Jedi. Yep. Instead, Obi-Wan tries to turn Vader and bring him back to the light side so that he and Anakin can go pay a visit to Palpatine and take down the Empire once and for all. Unfortunately for Obi-Wan, he realizes that his friend is long gone and only Darth Vader remains. So yeah, that would have been like the final nail in the coffin would have been like him realizing that. But now that he sees it, like actively seeing it, Face and all, like even like this, uh, that's no different than just laying the coffin in the dirt. Like, no, this is it in its full force. Almost kind of similar to when Ahsoka fought Vader in uh, Rebels. Like, just, no, here it is, here it is, full image and all. Like, this is it. As they resume the duel, Vader pushes Obi-Wan off the platform they're fighting on as he disappears. As they try to find Kenobi to see if he's dead or alive, Reva tells Vader that she killed him so that Vader would stop hunting him, leading Vader to kill her in a rage. And originally, Reva was supposed to die. Like, that was in the original script, but... You know, for those who have seen the show, haven't... Yeah, no, she, that's, that's the stupid thing, actually. She survives getting stabbed twice. And people have been i don't know if it's even a joke like obviously not but the one disappointment that people have is people getting stabbed and they just shrug it off like riva gets stabbed twice shrugs it off uh sabine gets stabbed though i wouldn't say it's dead center that uh qui-gon would have gotten stabbed because qui-gon he got stabbed dead center sabine i looked at it it looked like she got stabbed 
like on the side <laughs> like they're not really treating how lethal these lightsabers are supposed to be nor were there any dismemberments like i can think of i had, I had uh, talked about a friend once either people get their heads cut off they get cut in half or they get a limb cut off he's either one of those but ever since disney bought star wars it's always been no people getting stabbed no dismemberment of any kind for the second movie, BD wanted to explore how Obi-Wan came to accept his eventual fate in A New Hope. As he felt, Obi-Wan choosing to sacrifice himself was pretty sudden and required pre-acceptance that it was going to happen. As that makes way more sense. I, again, to bits like that. Like, I just, you know, being a dead horse here, but I'm just going to say it again. This, I can accept. This is way more convincing than the show ever will be. In fact, uh, for context, I never even finished it. Um, I only watched up to episode four, and that was it. Because the last two, I didn't even bother. I looked up reviews after I saw episode four, because knowing me, I might miss some things here and there. But there were some moments where I, you know, tilted my head and raised my eyebrow. You know, started asking questions. And then after looking up some reviews, yeah, I it was... No, I, I came to the conclusion, and then that's what prompted me to say, this isn't working. This, you know, Disney, Lucasfilm, Star Wars just is not working at all. And, you know, I just stopped, and then I just said, okay, if it's not Dave Filoni or John Favreau, I don't care. So far, the only good things that come from Disney Star Wars were Mandalorian Season 1 and 2. Um, there were some good things in uh, Clone Wars Season 7. Uh, Bad Batch, which I think is weaker than the Clone Wars and Rebels, but there's still some good things about it. So, and then uh, Tales of the Empire or Tales of the Jedi. Tales of the Jedi I like more than Empire. And then there's Star Wars Vision. So overall, out of everything that Disney has put out when they acquire Star Wars, were Mandalorian season one and two, Bad Batch, Tales of the Jedi. Tells the Empire and Star Wars Visions. And then everything after that is just take it back to the drawing board. Like Book of Boba Fett, Kenobi, obviously. Like, no, bring back the movie and then, you know, for Ahsoka. Yeah, no, back to the drawing board. As a result, in the second film, Obi-Wan would have either learned through a prophecy or from the ghost of Qui-Gon of a moment in the future where he's going to have to sacrifice himself for the good. Obi-Wan would have rejected this at first, arguing that he's here to help, but the film would have explored his eventual acceptance of the idea that he needs to die willingly at a crucial moment. On top of that, Obi-Wan also would have learned from Qui-Gon how to become more powerful in death than in life. Yeah, and this is something I think that, yeah, this was, there was a plot point intervention of the Sith that spoke of this like Kenobi would have to train under Qui-Gon and this would be the outcome all of this adds up so nicely and I think the reason yeah the big reason why we never got this is just the underperformance of the other films I would think because this feels like such a downgrade compared to what would have happened because let's just assume that uh, they did use George Lucas' sequel trilogy. That, I believe, would have um, sparked some trust to uh, for people to see the other films, you know, Rogue One and Solo. But because, you know, we ended up with what we got, the First Order saga. No, that wasn't the case. Um, no, I mean, I, I looked at the reviews, the percentages of Rotten Tomatoes, and no, like, they just were not adding up. You know, I consider Rogue One to be the lesser evil compared to, you know, Force Awakens, Last Jedi, Rise of Skywalker, and Solo. And there hasn't been a movie since. In fact, the upcoming movies are movies that people don't want to see. Nobody wants to see the Rey movie. I'm pretty sure some people are looking forward to the Mandalorian movie. But after the First Order Saga, Rogue One, and Solo... You know, there hasn't been anything. It's just nothing but TV shows on Disney Plus this entire time. So now that 
they want to get back into making movies, you know, after they canceled the, what is it, the Rose Squadron movie, they want to make another movie with some lady that I never even heard of. And it's centered around the First Order saga again. Like, no, nobody wants to see that. Okay, I, you know, I, I feel kind of bad for Daisy, really, to be honest, because, you know, she's playing her part and, you know, she's done it gracefully you know i never i I never once gave any thought that ray was such an eyesore but because people just didn't like how she turned out you know i mean i can't ignore the facts here people hate the first order saga and it doesn't make any sense to go back to it in any capacity for any reason as for the mando movie um not that I'm crossing my fingers, because after what happened with season three, I think the fire just died down for it. So people are just not that excited for Star Wars like they used to be. And, you know, um, Disney using George Lucas's sequel trilogy would have saved it. It would have been like, OK, George's sequel trilogy, bam, Rogue One, bam, Solo, bam. And then we get this, you know, the Kenobi trilogy of all things like it. This already feels like this would be better off as just a standalone movie like Kenobi, a Star Wars story. That would have been fine. Three of these? Like, that would have that would have filled in seats almost guaranteed, but no. Like, all these downgrades, all these bad decisions, just not looking into the lore, not giving any care about what George Lucas wrote down. Even, what's her name, Leslie Helen, who wrote The Acolyte, is going against what George Lucas wrote down what he talked about these are the people that are writing star wars now people who don't care so it's like okay if they don't care then why should we why are they rewriting what george lucas has wrote has written down saying that he's not the only one that understands it like they're talking about the creator here okay the only time that they should question about his motives is as if he would initially just intentionally damage the brand which I haven't seen. I personally do not think that George Lucas is the type of person that would just go out of his way to damage his own brand like that. No, like, no, I don't believe it. So it's, it's, you know, this is heavy stuff here, man. Like this is no, like no one can ignore this. Like nobody, nobody as a force ghost. So what went wrong? After Solo underperformed at the box office, Disney canceled their planned Star Wars spin-off films and pivoted to making series for their new streaming service, Disney+. Plus. The first series would be The Mandalorian, with plans for an Obi-Wan series to follow. Unfortunately for Stuart Beatty, he wasn't asked to stay on to write the series. However, after the series was written without him, Kathleen Kennedy was said to be unhappy with the scripts, after Filoni and Favreau expressed concern that they covered similar ground to The Mandalorian, as both featured a lone wolf-like character protecting a child. Allegedly, Darth Maul would have been one of the main villains in this series, but when the scripts were rewritten, Maul was cut out. As series director Deborah Chow would say that Dave Filoni did a beautiful job of telling that story already in the animated series Star Wars Rebels. Yeah, I can, yeah, I can believe that. I would like to think that Maul did really meet his conclusion, yeah, in, in Rebels, but I'm still curious about, I, can, I find I think there might be some videos about it, um, how Maul would just play out in the uh, sequel trilogy. Again, it's it's a it's a shame. And featuring Maul in the Kenobi series would be a little too oh, much, this considering too. Vader was going to be in it too. It was Dave Filoni, however, who suggested they include the Grand Inquisitor from Star Wars Rebels. For his part, Stuart Beatty would be credited on the first three episodes of the Obi-Wan series, as well as on the final episode, saying that they took elements from his script and turned it from a two-hour movie into a six-hour series, and that he was devastated that he didn't get to make his trilogy. Six-hour series? What? as Ewan was on board, ready to go, and the pair were so excited about it. And while Han Solo was always one of, if not the most popular characters from the original trilogy, those films were made 40 years ago. And say what you want about the prequels, but Ewan McGregor's portrayal of Obi-Wan Kenobi was almost universally praised. As a result, had an Obi-Wan standalone film been made before Solo, it likely would have been much better received, regardless of the fact that it came on the heels of the device of Last Jedi. And if that had happened, not only would we have gotten two other films to complete Obi-Wan's trilogy, but Disney would like 
likely still be producing big screen standalone adventures featuring other characters from the Star Wars universe to this day. Like, what a disappointment. What a disappointment. Like, if they just cared, if they just used George Lucas's trilogy from the get-go, from the get-go, like, seriously, and then just followed up with, you know, um, Rogue One and then Solo, maybe Solo would have been just the black sheep, but at the barest minimum, you had what George Lucas put out, you know, whatever the case that may be, um, Rogue One, and then, you know, the Kenobi movie apparently three of them and this only covered like the first one and i want to say um parts of the second one like man this is the part this 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 there's a lesson that needs to be learned here because this really goes to show what happens when you have a well thought out convincing plan and then you go against that and do something else Obi-Wan Kenobi should not have been a six episode series. It like I still hold to that belief. It should have been a movie. And now I'm seeing that. So as it is right now, yeah, two movies are being made, but for the wrong reasons. These are not like whatever new movies are coming out for Star Wars, those are movies that people don't want. Okay, people would rather have a movie like this. Just like this. And we're not getting that because of asinine decisions like this. Like, no, just downgrade into a TV show. Why? Like, why even why even consider that? So yeah, this this really goes to show that um, you know, a good idea is either never left alone or is just never put out the way it's supposed to. And then we can only yearn for the thing that we could have had. And instead, we have to put up for something inferior that we do have. So, yeah, something like this really should bite them in the ass because, like, you, they could have had a good thing here. And they chose not to. So, I mean, with the likes of the First Order Saga, uh, the Kenobi show, among other live-action shows, and with the upcoming Ray movie, yeah, it's, it's becoming more apparent. They're digging this grave, man. And, you know, they may have put Star Wars in it, but hey, never forget the grave digger is also following suit and jumping right in as well. Kind of depressing if you ask me. So, yeah, um, I just wanted to get this out there because I found this most intriguing because that is it. It's like I said, heavy. And now that I'm knowing about it, and now knowing about what we could have had, and instead what we got, yeah. Um, everyone, yeah, everyone set their peace. And until this franchise is handled by better people, um, we can only look forward to more garbage to come. And yeah, unfortunately, the next film is written by a wim a woman who, and I quote, wants to make men uncomfortable and the new star wars show the acolyte which is written by somebody who really doesn't care about what george lucas uh, has ever written uh, wrote down or has ever said so yeah um for me personally um tales of the empire is as far as i'm gonna go you know bad batch wrapped up and i'm just not looking forward to anything else not the acolyte not Skeleton Crew, not the Ray movie, not the Mandalorian Grogu. No, no. Tales of the Empire, that's that's it for me. I'll look forward to Star Wars Outlaws and I'll be reserving judgment because that's getting a lot of flack. But I'll reserve judgment and see how that um, pulls through. I look forward to Outlaws and I will not be looking forward to Acolyte or Skeleton Crew or the Ray movie, or Mandalorian and Grogu, because what Star Wars needs more than anything is a complete overhaul. 